Hey everybody, this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey is brought to you by our title sponsor, NHL Sense Arena. Look, we all want our kids to succeed in hockey, but let's face it, finding training that's both effective and enjoyable can be a real challenge, and not to mention expensive and a total drain on time, especially if you have to drive to the rink, uh, pay a, a private instructor. There's so many reasons that uh, money gets spent on this game. But that's where NHL Sense Arena steps in. It's a virtual reality training game that brings the rink into your home that takes off-ice training to a new reality. It's designed to improve hockey sense and IQ, something that's lacking majorly in the game today for both players and goalies. And you get unlimited access to over 100 drills and training plans from top coaches and players that can be played anytime, anywhere with drills approved by USA Hockey player and goalie development directors. Look, improving mental hockey skills at home has really never been more fun and any hockey player that uses this is going to have a blast, all right? I've used this before on my own and it feels like you're so immersed in an arena you sometimes forget you have a headset on. And again, it's not being on the ice, but it allows you to work on some of these skill sets like scanning, as I said before, hockey IQ, looking around the rink, making the right plays, that getting those repetitions in now as a hockey player are super important for your development. So NHL Sense Arena is giving all the listeners an exclusive offer for $50 off an annual plan when you use our code Hockey never stops at checkout. Again, that's hockey never stops. All you got to do is go to hockey.sensarena.com. Uh, Again, that's hockey.sensarena.com. Use the code hockey never stops and you'll save $50 on your an annual plan of NHL Sense Arena. Make sure to check that out and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, powered by NHL Sense Arena. I'm Lee Elias with Mike Benelli and Christy Casciano burns and our guest today has been with the Chicago Blackhawks organization since 2020 and is the president of business operations, where she has many responsibilities. But my favorite description of her role, which I think summed it up, is to advance the fan experience, and that is something her team is clearly succeeding at. With that said... We should note that Jamie's qualifications and experience are off the chart, and there are too many to list, but let's list a few. In 2015, Jamie was named one of the Sports Business Journal's Women's Game Changers, and she was also named to their 40 under 40 list in 2016. In 2019, she was named one of the SBJ's Sports Power Players of the Year, and the following year, she was recognized by Venues Now as an industry all-star. For those of you that work in the broadcasting and sports world, those are very prestigious honors. Sports also runs in the family. Her husband, Colin, is the executive vice president, sales and marketing, and chief commercial officer for the Chicago Cubs. And the two have five children, Avery, Blake, Drew, Maddie, and Nolan. And their family doesn't end there. The Faulkners have served as a billet family for several young hockey players over the years, many whom have gone on to the NHL. We are speaking to a hockey game changer today. Jamie Faulkner, welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Thanks for having me. Oh, that was good. Yeah, no, it's it's our pleasure to have you. I love reading intros like that. Um, I love bringing people that are not just trailblazers, but impactful in the game. And I know that our audience loves it too. And I want to start right there on that impact, Jamie. You know, one of the coolest things the Blackhawks have introduced uh, this year is this best game ever event, uh, or I should say events throughout the season. And we speak all the time on this show about the importance of creating that environment, a welcoming environment, an environment for hockey that anyone can jump into, and you've done it. So tell us about how this came to be and then how it may differ from other NHL team events. So we we have a really special atmosphere here just in general for Blackhawks games. I think you hear our players say that a lot. Um, our fans love it. It's the place to be in the winter time. So in right. Chicago, if the place to be in the summertime is Wrigley Field, the place to be in the winter time is at the United Center, um, watching the Blackhawks. And so we already have a great environment. Um, it's not so great for kids. Um, and I'm obviously a hockey mom. I have littles at home. So Maddie and Nolan are eight and six. So even, and one of them plays hockey, but even in trying to, as every parent knows, trying to bring kids to games having them stay engaged when all they want to do is run around, eat food. Um, what we want to do is create fans out of them, right? If that's your, we, we have also, I would say, part of what makes our environment special is we have all these traditions that have been passed down from family to family to family. 
we're going to put an effort into bringing new fans into the Blackhawks family. How do we start to teach those traditions to the younger kids coming into? So we looked at it as a way of how do we change the game so we stay core to who we are. If you're not coming with kids, you're still having a great time. We start to build fandom with these new little ones that are walking through the door, but also teach some of the traditions about the Blackhawks and the game of hockey so that they're engaged as much as we can keep them engaged. No, I, I love that. And like I said, every community, every team is a little different. We're going to get into it a little later, you know, with the Blackhawks being an original six franchise, there's a lot of history there, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of tradition there that, you know, you can't disrupt the, the traditionalist fan base I shouldn't say disrupt. That's not the right word, but you don't want to make them angry for whatever reason, right? I mean, you got, you have to build new fans, but you've also taken this initiative beyond just the best game ever, right? You're, you're doing animated games. Um, you've also, I've got, I've got a list of things here that you guys are doing. You're trying to make a commitment to the state of Illinois to grow the game as well. Mm-hmm. Maybe dive into that as well, because that's, I don't think people understand how much of an undertaking it is. Well, a to do an animated thing, but, but to, to expand into a state and make sure that you know, hockey rinks, indoor, outdoor are popping up and that kids feel welcome to come. So how are, how are you pushing that forward? Yeah, it was when I started working for the Blackhawks. Well, even when I was not working for the Blackhawks, but lived in Chicago, I was a hockey mom. Mm-hmm. So we were bill apparent, as you had mentioned. Um, I, one of my sons, well, both my sons played hockey, one more seriously than the other. Um, the Blackhawks weren't that involved in mm-hmm. hockey. They weren't involved I didn't feel like they were as involved as they should be in growing the game in the state of Illinois, providing opportunities for kids to become fans of the Blackhawks. Um, So I, I was really passionate about that when I came and started in this role. We believe we have an obligation as the NHL club here in our market and in the Midwest, quite, quite honestly, to influence hockey in a very positive way in order for us to be able to do that. We want to make sure that kids and their very first touch of the ice or exposure to the Blackhawks is a good one. We want to make sure that their last exposure on the ice, whether you're graduating out of high school, for those that are lucky enough to continue on, that's great. But most kids stop playing when they go to college, Um, but they still stay in love with the game. But we want to make sure that experience is really good and then start to work our way into the middle. And so in order to do that, we said, well, we've got to attack every part of the ecosystem. We can't just do right by the players and the families in order for for us to grow the game in order for amateur hockey to work we've got to have safe locker rooms we've got to have great coaches we have to have enough referees we have to have rings that that can stay afloat and actually operate profitable profitably we need to have um great associations we need to have a great governing body so we looked at the whole ecosystem and said how do we start to get involved with every piece of that And then also, what do we have to offer outside of that? So we wanted there to be tons of front doors where people could come and access Blackhawks hockey or hockey in general. So we actually built it. The the funny thing is for us here at the Blackhawks, most of our business strategies, it's like a five year rolling strategy. So every year we add the fifth year on. For us with amateur hockey, we actually looked at it like a 10 year strategy. Mm. It's going to take a long time to change the footprint here. That's how committed we are. We are investing in a 10 year plan to try to grow the game, fix the game here in the Midwest. Um, Because we know it's important to our future fan base, but it's also like, again, what I said earlier, it's an obligation. Like we, we have an obligation as the NHL club to do that. So we've, we've attacked everything um, from, best day ever, which we do five times a year here at the United Center, to how do we actually partner up with AHI, the governing body, to partnering up with everybody within that ecosystem. And then also you mentioned the animated game, like what things aren't happening today that we can add in that may generate a new fan. So we've taken everything, flipped it upside down and said, how do we get involved? What's the right thing to do? But backing that is pretty serious investment. We've built out a whole group within the Blackhawks that that's their job. They wake up every single day thinking, how do I grow the game of hockey? How do I get Generation Z involved? How do I get the next generation alpha involved? Um, and how do we do it in the right way? So we've, we're have we looking at everything. Yeah, it's a 10-year plan. Where are you at and how far have you come so far? Yeah, so we're, I would say we're year two into that plan. So things that exist today that didn't, happened before. So if you think just about our game, we talked about the best day ever. We now have 
a consistent product that parents can rely on and it's working on our best day. What we heard our parents say related to that was we want to bring our kids. We need to bring them on the weekends and we need earlier start times. So we worked really hard to not only create a game that was interesting for littles and kids under the age of 12 or 14, but also it had to be at the right time. We had to make it easy for a parent to be able to make the choice to, to come. We have to work with the league on that. And the league was fantastic about working with us on getting the ability to have those weekend dates with earlier start times. And it works. If you come into one of our best day ever games, at least 4,000 of our fans are kids. That's I mean, awesome. it's you can hear the energy is different. So we're seeing the impact of that. Other things we're doing is when I talk about like getting involved with kids, their first touch of the ice, building out our little Blackhawks program, which a lot of clubs have, which is the program that the NHL is very involved in, which gives you free hockey equipment to sign up. But what we're learning, and I think any of you guys who have coached or played or parent of hockey players, that's not enough, right? You you need to get on the ice multiple times before you're ready to path into might hockey. Um, and so we're stretching that program to say like, hey, can you repeat that program? Um, can you run it? Can you do three sessions of Little Blackhawks before you're ready to go into some type of might program or some type of house program? So we're building that out. But we're also looking at pathing that, right? So we're building an actual path. We want you to try hockey for free then enroll in a program and then path into something. Cause I think one of the things that we learned was there's a lot of great programs, but you're one and done. You don't know what to do next. Like you have no idea. Where do I go next? Very true. And there's big gaps in those paths. So I do some type of free program, whether that's learn to skate or learn to play. And then the next ask is you need to join a program that's $3,000 four times a week on the ice. Like <laughs> that's crazy. I yeah. don't, I love hockey. I don't even want to do that with my kids, right. with six, seven and eight. So really creating pathing that takes you from your start all the way to the end with our focus on high school hockey. So one of the other things we've introduced is what we call our high school rivalry series. We're taking rivals, um, these high schools that play each other and we're highlighting those games. We're getting super involved in the state championship. So we're building out these program elements along the way that allow us to get involved, um, build relationships with this community um, across the board. So almost everything is new that we're doing, or we're just putting it on, you know, putting some jet fuel behind it. Yeah. I can see how your input, being a hockey mom, is super valuable. I mean, how much did you go to the fans directly and, and say, hey, what do you want from us? What do you listen to the fans? Is that really critical to your success? And you where have you're going? To. Yeah, yes. you have to. I think part of our success in anything that we do is listening to the fans. I mean, we we are the caretakers of this franchise. The franchise is owned by the fan base. And so if you walk into that um, with the fan first, everything else takes care of itself. And when we think about our hockey families, um, listening to what's important to them is driving some of the changes that we're making in the program, but we also have to like be in the rinks, right? So it's one thing to be like, we're going to survey you and we're going to do a focus group. Are we actually in the community? Are we of the community? Are we showing up at the rinks on Saturday and Sunday mornings? Are we walking the journey with these parents, these coaches, the refs? Again, we're, we're trying to look at the full ecosystem. Wow. Um, in order for us to do really well, we have to understand like, what's it like to be a ref here? When you're getting, you're, there's not enough. You're getting yelled at by parents, right? How do we empower you? How do we, do we have the right coaches? So like we're in it. So we're listening, but we're also, we have that team. That's their job is to be in it every single day. Wow. That's such a great formula. I wish more communities would do this. Yeah, so Jamie, let's let, you know. Let's talk. You know, you're you're in a great uh, area to talk to these parents right directly here. And and I think when you're speaking to organizations, and and we know your we know your area very well. You know, from a USA Hockey perspective, and from a, just a youth hockey world of having great great youth hockey programs. I mean, some of the best programs in the country, you know, come out of Chicago, and are are really killing it right at the at the AAA levels. Mm -hmm. But maybe speak to the parent that that is going from this bottlenecked, learn the play, you know, rookie league type thing that the NHL does, which 
brings hundreds and hundreds of kids in. And then the next year they go to their local rink and there's two squirt teams. And you're like, okay, whoa, whoa. we went from, we have 140 kids. And now you're telling me we have to call it down to 30 and, and, you know, and the money, you know, the bottom line is it does cost money to play hockey and, and that's, but maybe talk about, you know, how you and the Chicago and the NHL really help supplement that and, 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 and build it into your 10 year plan in this case that, you know, you can wait a year or two or three years and not make a profit, but the rinks have to make profits. The rinks have to stay open. They're not there to help Chicago sell tickets. They're there to keep their doors open. So maybe talk a little bit about what that infrastructure looks like so that, you know, the rinks can feel really confident in the NHL clubs that listen, if you go on this journey with us, we're going to keep your dollars in your rink. Like we're going to keep your kids playing long term because I would imagine, I, and I look at this probably a little differently. Like a rec kid actually has more disposable income than a travel AAA mm-hmm. family because they're not spending their money on AAA hockey. They could go to sh- more, you know, greatest day ever events. Mm-hmm. And so maybe talk about that a little bit for a parent that says, "Oh, in my community, the only step for me is to I, I get roped in, and we all, and that's why we're on this podcast, mm-hmm. right? We love hockey." They love hockey. The kids love hockey. The parents love hockey. And he's like, oh, but by the way, now your whole life has to revolve around hockey. And the reason you loved it is because maybe it didn't. I mean, I think part of what we're trying to do is like get rid of this false narrative that you have to decide at six years old whether you're going to play hockey or not. Right. And that the only way to play hockey is to be on the ice three, four, five days a week. So I think there's two things, right? One is – How do we not lose these kids when they step on? We've got to be honest about the fact that it does take a while to learn the sport, just like any sport. And we need to create more of an opportunity for people to do that and not be so quick to path them up. The reason they're trying to path them up is they want the dollars. Listen, I just dealt with this situation. I have a six-year-old. He's playing house mites. He technically, he's a 17, he's a 2017. He could go house mite next year or he could go travel mite next year. So we're faced with the decision as a hockey parent. I know what's better for him is getting as many touches of on the ice and touches of the puck as possible, not sitting on the bench, watching a game play, a full ice game play. Like that's not going to help him develop and he's not going to have a lot of fun, but that's not the narrative. The narrative is if you don't play spring travel, you're not going to get on the mic. Right. And, and so that is fear. There's a lot of fear. And so uh, parents who aren't committed to hockey are like, forget this. I'm going to go stick with soccer and baseball and do other things. I think the other thing too, is most of the other sports have community based sports where you can go serious, but you can also do rec play. You can practice one day a week, play a game while you're playing all your other sports. Hockey doesn't have that option either. So what we're trying to do is one, change the narrative of you're not going to be left behind. And if somebody's selling you that you better Take their name down because you probably don't want to play for them down the road because they don't have your child's best interest in mind. Two is how do we help these clubs and these rinks create programs that are community based where you can still if you still love hockey, but you love baseball more or something's going on in that spring year and you can't commit. You still can stay on the ice and play one day a week or two days a week until you're ready to commit down the road. Or maybe that's all you ever do, but that should be okay. That should be good enough. So. There's a lot of gaps, but I mean, honestly, it's changing the narrative with these hockey clubs. It's holding coaches and clubs and club presidents accountable. The rinks aren't the problem. The hockey clubs are the problem. The right, and I think, are. and I think for you, like you have the ability, and, and just so people that are listening can understand the context here, like the Blackhawks, like a lot of NHL clubs, have the ability to buy ice on Saturday morning from nine to eleven, yes. and then and then tell an or, and tell a rink owner, mm-hmm. we're gonna do. Every, like, like to me, it's it's almost it's crazy. God, we're in the East Coast here, so we do a lot of work with the the Rangers and the Islanders and the Devils. And I look at these rings, saying, I, I don't understand why that six hundred dollars an hour isn't the same as the six hundred you're getting from the other families. Like, a matter of fact, and and the NHL club is putting maybe a hundred more kids on the ice mm-hmm. and managing it better for the long term success of you, you, the organization that needs these kids later on. And you know, and I always look at it as from a point of view as Listen, the Blackhawks should be selfish and say, we want every kid wearing a Conor Bedard jersey. And we want every kid, you know, being in a Blackhawk uniform. We want we want kids going to baseball practice wearing their Blackhawk hat. Like that's – but 
I think us as parents should embrace the selfishness and say, listen, they're funding this at, I mean, you know, whatever your budget is, four or five million dollars a year on building these rinks, building these programs, doing referee uh, education, doing coaching education, giving parents the ability to say there is a time and a place to go all in. Mm -hmm. But most of us, the the mo the majority, like I, I actually just had a funny. I was having a conversation on the weekend. One of the one of the guys I was having a conversation with is a uh, is a uh, graduate of the uh, Chicago Mission program, so real high level hockey, mm -hmm. and saying. Man, I remember growing up, I could play travel hockey and still go to my rec hockey, mm -hmm. like and still play with my friends. And it never, I never felt like, oh, they're the, they're the, they're they're the kids that are like the, something's wrong with them because they don't mm -hmm. play hockey every day. So I think what you guys are doing with the NHL side is really so refreshing. And it, it but it's staying power, right? It's like, mm -hmm. my God, can we do this for ten years? Like, it, like that's like it's hard for a parent of a six year old right now to see that vision. Right. So they get scared that well, it's not it's not really my kid that's going to benefit from this. But yeah. I think the the efforts of what you've done and the numbers <laughs> and Lee, we talked about. I forget what the one of the guests we had on just about the, the, the amount of players that have fallen under the NHL umbrella. And, you know, I get these you'll get the you know, the statistics from a Matt Her or something like that and say, you know, we're introducing hockey to literally thousands and thousands and thousands of more kids. Now we have to find a way to keep them. If we yeah. love the sport. Well, That's you know, right. I'll, I'll say this too, to, to both of you and you specifically, Jamie, like the shared narrative, or wait, wait, let me rephrase that. What should be the shared narrative between the hockey organizations and NHL organizations from kind of, let's just say 12 you down just to give it a bracket right now is falling in love with the game. And again, we're recording this in, in mid March. I've had multiple conversations with parents about, you know, well, what if he doesn't make the double A team next year? And I'm like, that that's just not where your focus should be right now. Your focus should be development, finding the team where they're going to learn the most. And above all, and I've had to say this, making sure your kid loves the game. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a shared vision, obviously, for multiple reasons. One is your kid's not going to play past 18 if they hate this. They won't play past 15, right? Um, from, a, from a shared vision, NHL club to a uh, youth organization – the more the kid loves the game, the more everybody wins later on. Right? We don't we don't have to explain that too much, right? You're going to be a lifelong fan. Um, I think people falsely assume like, oh well, they, he loves the game at six, so he's going to love the game forever. Uh, that is not always true. All right? I, I have seen kids, and it's horrible watching a 16, 17, 18 year old burnout with plenty of talent just because no one's ever asked them, "Do you want to do this?" Yeah. Right. So the the narrative that I'd like to see is changed, and youth organizations can do this. They will say that they can't. Because if they don't have competitive teams at double A, mm -hmm. A, you know, no one's going to show up. I don't, I, I don't believe this. I think it just takes the guts of an organization to say, you know what? Our organization from this age down is all about love of the game and development. So that when your kid is 16 years old, if they have the talent, they can go in the direction of the Chicago mission. Or they can play in a rec league at 16 that is fun and competitive and keeps them in love with the game. Mm -hmm. Um I don't yeah, buy it. Nuts that these parents, yeah. doesn't it nuts that these parents see that? Like they're they're in the rink. All these adult males and females are playing hockey. There's one Chicago Blackhawk team, and there's <laughs> nine thousand adult league teams. Like yes. so, there is rec yeah. hockey. So I, it's, what's crazy to me is like we 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 are giving the rec hockey just to the adults. Why aren't we giving rec hockey that's a great, to six, that's seven, a great eight year old? Like, <laughs> it's just there could be one club. I get it, but the rest of us are rec. And 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 rec and maybe that's a bad and maybe that's where we got to change the name, right? It's not rec hockey. It's just it, it's sane hockey. It's it's just <laughs> it's, it's hockey of yeah. it's hockey that you should be able to do. And and it, and it's so frustrating for me because I see you never hear AYSO soccer players like, oh my god, I wish I could travel four hours to go play another group of six year olds. Like you don't hear it. Like you just <laughs> they just say, I don't know, they stink, we stink, we all stink. Let's just let's enjoy let's it. Stink together. Yeah, let's just stink <laughs> together and not have to travel anywhere. And all go to Carvel together, but I think it's yeah. like it, it's just. But I think so. Again, I think we're. I'm probably speaking from a point of view that we we haven't seen this jump yet. That, that that Jamie, that you guys are doing, like we haven't seen somebody take control of that vision and say, well, we're going to change the narrative now. And you know, you might not. It might not be here for you, but it will be here. Yeah. yeah. I'm, go ahead. The here's the I was just going to say there are a lot of communities that, you know, like ours, we don't have a Blackhawks leading the way, you know? So what do we do in our area? Yeah, I mean, you know? I... Rangers. Call the Rangers. <laughs> 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 me is 
you know, these, this institution has been around for a long time in, let's say, let's just say for the Chicagoland area of how hockey works. It has been handed down for a long time. There have been people who have been in it for a very long time who don't even have kids in the sport anymore. It has to improve and evolve. It just hasn't evolved. There also weren't a lot of people, I think, with a good business mind coming in saying, okay, listen, the structure's broken. We all have, if we all really have the same goals and the structure isn't working, let's fix the structure. And it's going to take us time to do it. But if we're really all committed and if we do it the right way, everybody wins, let's change this. Those are some of the things, again, that's why we're working with everybody. Um, we want the rings to be profitable, but we also want clubs to be profitable because if clubs are more profitable, they don't have to charge mites three to five grand to play. Right. They can have a house program that allows kids to play once, twice a week. By the way, no matter what age, because the other thing we're, you know, I had one kid who all he wanted to do was play hockey. I had another kid who had to make the decision and he loved hockey, but baseball was, he loved baseball more. He had to give up hockey to play travel baseball because at 12, there was no option for him to still go one day a week, two days a week to play. We want to keep you in at all levels. We don't want to lose you at some point when you specialize. So the clubs become really important because we have to make that okay. Right. It's it's the we don't want to make OK being on the premier number one might team or number one squirt team or peewee team. You do you when you come play and we're going to offer all levels of play. But what that does from a business perspective is you have more money. Right. You're getting more kids into the system. And so if at 12 you figure out the <laughs> is your thing, you now can path into that. But you've been on the ice for a while. Or if you decide it's not, you can still stay in play while you're doing something else that's more important to you. Um, that the system is broken. The structure is broken. So right. why it's going to take us 10 years is because we have to actually come in and help fix the structure, which means yeah. we have to get in the business of the leagues. We have to get in the business of the governing body of AHI. But we're, we're, what I would say is we're bringing people together, we're having really honest conversations about what's working, what's not working, putting some accountability in place and slowly starting to change how people perceive the sport or their desire to come and get in and stay in But it's right. a lot of work because you have to have some really hard conversations with people who are making a lot of money and they don't want to hear it or they don't want right. to change because that's the way it's always been done. Right. But isn't isn't the coolest part of that that you have the biggest carrot? Like you have the you have the player, you have the you have the arena. Yeah. You have you know, you those guys don't have that. You have Connor Bedard. You're like, I can put you on the glass watching this kid warm up and it that is the love like that is where players get inspired that is where players yeah. want to go back and do those things and i think that's where the nhl clubs sometimes maybe for years haven't understood it's not about how many corporate seats you can sell it's how many six-year-olds you can inspire and guess who that who's stuck with that inspiration mom and dad they're like oh crap this kid likes hockey <laughs> this is not good like now i gotta go to the rink every weekend but again if you make it if you make it where it's it's you know i love but i love it and just and so everybody in the audience knows like what what i loved about what the nhl's initiatives are is like you know you're not you know that no tunnels no tolls you know it's philosophy that that, that philosophy that you know practices started family friendly times that 5 30 a.m six-year-old skills clinic isn't like part of the the, the development of this program. And I used to joke all the time when that first started, I'm like, yeah, give that to the 12 year olds. They're stuck already. Like they're not telling you they can't go. They have to go. They're in, the, they're in the program already. But those, those 9.00 AM starts on a Saturday morning, I, you know, parents of older kids would have loved that opportunity. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, that's where you and the NHL and, and in this case, the Chicago Blackhawks have the most power because no organization has the power of that, of that organization in the, yeah. you know, in your city. I feel like we've been really lucky. We we went out and we've established relationships with all the rinks. We've established formal partnerships with, with most of the hockey clubs. We have a partnership with AHI. We're bringing people together. And, and the good news is everybody seems to be on board. We just, somebody needed to bring everybody into the room right. that could say like, listen, can we drop the egos at the door? If we do this right, it's going to be good for everybody. Can we just do the right thing? Um, and realize we all need each other to get it done, right? Like clubs need rinks, rinks need clubs. The governing body needs to govern properly, right? Because they're setting, the leagues need clubs to be able to fill the, we we all need each other. So the I think what's encouraging and inspiring to us is 
we aren't the only ones who care deeply about this game. There are the clubs, the rinks, everybody that's involved, they're involved because they care deeply about it. If we can just come sort of be the conductor, bringing everybody together, getting them on the right track, getting a good path for everybody to, and then let's work through these issues together. That's why we've been able to have so much movement. I'd love to say it's because we have the carrot and we're the Blackhawks and we got Connor Bedard. But the reality is we've made a ton of progress in two years because people are showing up with us because they love this game so much and they're willing to change it. They want these kids to play. They want them to stay in hockey. But again, it's just going to take us a long time to get it done. But the commitment is there. You know, Jamie, I'll, I'll dive in here too. <clears throat> you know, one of the things we hear from fan bases and, and I, like I've been very blessed to be around the league, around the teams is that I don't think sometimes fans fully understand the dedication that the member clubs make to their area. And I love hearing, I mean, really love hearing and the audience should too, that, well, in this area, the NHL team is leading the charge to unify everybody because that's what's best for hockey, right? Um, and, and look, <clears throat> I understand why fans sometimes complain about ticket prices and money and things like that. But at the end of the day, I, I, there is such a dedication from the member clubs, and we've spoken to many of them on this show. Um, and you said it earlier, I love the way you said it, like their job is to wake up thinking about how to expand the game. I mean, so the NHL clubs are, including the Blackhawks, obviously, insanely dedicated to this, right? And it's it's one of those jobs and one of those initiatives where the ROI is not apparent on a spreadsheet immediately after you do it. Like the, the, we talked about this before with other organizations, this the stat of lifetime value of a fan, which is a very important number for NHL teams. But it takes potentially decades to build that. So you have to have the patience. You have to have the, the, the foresight to look ahead and see the macro of these situations where so many people just see the micro. Right. But I love, again, hearing that, that you're leading the charge as the Blackhawks organization to make sure that you're unifying these groups mm -hmm. and finding a way forward. I, I did want to ask this, and, and I, I do have to ask a Connor Bedard question later, but I think we're on a good, so good do I, string here. I got yeah. Blackhawk fa fans in my family. <laughs> if I don't ask, I will not yeah. be forgiven. So. Yeah, we, we got to keep our ratings up, I too. Right now. Tomorrow. I, I have a Denny Savard yeah. question, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, you know, I had this on my, my rundown. I wanted to ask this because it's, it's the right time. You know, we have a lot of organizational leaders that listen to this show, right? And I, I always get the feeling when I speak to them that it's not that they don't want to do anything. It's it's kind of a hands tied. I don't know what to do. And like you said, well, this is what we've always done and money's coming in. So what can I do? So I, I actually want to pose that question to you. Uh, and we're looking at this as a kind of a national way, but for the local youth hockey organizers and the leaders, what is something... It can be action items. It can be thoughts. What is something they can start to do now to better impact the future of hockey in their area moving forward? Right. And Jamie, you mentioned a key obstacle, egos. Nah. <laughs> they got to drop the egos. Yeah. yeah. I, I think what has actually been beneficial is bringing clubs together. We're lucky enough we're bringing them into the room. So we're bringing the leagues and the presidents of these associations into the room together to work together. Uh, not to compete against one another, because again, if everybody does the if everybody does this well, there'll be more than enough kids to play, right? And there'll be more than enough kids where you don't have to drive an hour to go to practice every day because you're five cities over, right? There's going to be a strong enough club where you live that you can stay and play one day a week, three days a week, five days a week, whatever you want to do. Um, so that's the biggest thing I would say. If you don't have your NHL club bringing you together step out and be the leader, drop the mm. ego, bring all the clubs together and say, are we doing what needs to be done? And you may have to do that without your governing body. We right. did it with AHI because they were supportive. So we were able to bring AHI in. We brought USA Hockey in. And we do a summit every year where we bring these groups together and facilitate what's our plan against our roadmap. So what do we need to do this next year? What worked last year? But you don't need the NHL club to do that. You just need an you just need a couple of presidents who are willing to say, I'm going to work with others to grow this game. We will come together and figure out how to do this. That's wonderful the way you put that. And I love that you said that because I know the people out there want to do it. You can do this. You can, you can put it forward. You know, I always say too, like even from a coaching standpoint, if we don't have an opponent, we can't play. <laughs> right. So it's like, you have to, you have to appreciate your, your quote unquote competition. You know, even when you look at it from a professional sports realm, um, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff that fans don't see is it doesn't help any NHL club if another one is suffering. Right. Right. Like, like, and, right. yeah, fans joke about it. NHL clubs. The league doesn't tell us 
we have to share information to work together. Right. Do it proactively because you know what? Some clubs are going to do it better than we do it at the Blackhawks. And they're right. willing to say like, hey, we've learned this. This is we're going to give you the toolkit or, or the way that we did it. We do some things better. We're happy to share because, again, if it's good for the NHL, it's going to be good right. for everybody. But, yeah, rising tide lifts all ships. Anything. Right. The, the rising. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I'm sorry. It was the, the rising tide lifts all ships. Right. And and again, that's the dropping of ego. And you can sit at home and say, well, it's easy for them to do. No. One of the reasons they're as large as they are in terms of the teams and the, at the league is because they do it this way. Right. It doesn't behoove them to hide information from each other. And and, you know, like like it's supposed to be with the 50 states, there's 32 teams and 32 different opportunities mm -hmm. to learn. So if best game ever takes off. You bet your butt you're going to start seeing other teams mimicking that, right? And, and I think that, again, it, I'm saying this because it's already a proven recipe of success. It's not a pipe dream, right? It's not this far-out concept that working together pays off, right? You have you have examples of this working it's in the real world. Sense, for sure. Right, right. So it, I just I just wanted to say that because I, I you know I think that is one some of the the best advice we've ever gotten from that question is you have to work together. And sure, compete on the ice, compete for those championships. But you have to understand that if all the organizations in the area are not constantly getting better, you know, it, it's not going to work long term, right? And and then that's when you get all the players going to one team, and that's not good. It is not a good situation. It it, it feeds into the monster, right? If and it, it feeds into the FOMO of well, why am I not on that Triple A team, right? And we all have a responsibility to do that. Now again, it's not going to take one person; it's going to take a group. Okay. Listen. And ten I'm, years. Yeah, <laughs> I am going to turn this. At least. <laughs> it's not going to change overnight. Right. And what's yeah. hard, and I think the reason why things don't change is you do have a limited life cycle of your kid playing. So you're like, well, I don't really care about high school hockey. They're going to play for four years and be done. So let somebody exactly. else deal with that, right? Um, we're here for the long haul, so we can be the consistent piece to say, like, hey, we're going to come. We're going to be walking alongside you forever. Mm. So. Love that. While parents are coming in and out, hockey presidents coming in and out, coaches coming in and out will be will be the constant. But it does take time and it takes effort. If you're really serious about it, the lazy way is to not do anything and kind of right. keep up with the bad behaviors. But right. um, it's going to take time and effort. And again, we're really fortunate. We've got really great hockey presidents here of these clubs who get right. it, who want to see this for the long. They want to leave it better than they found it. And that's the big thing. You got to leave it better than you found it. And if you're willing to okay. do that, you'll make better decisions. You're going to grow the game. You're going to be really proud that your kid played for that club years and years ago because of where they are today, even if they're in a much better place than when your kid played there. Right. And and I think that's a huge problem, too, is because we do cycle through so much. Like, for example, it, it, for us, you know, if, if we see problems along the way, by the time you get to the point where you you can see some viable solutions it's time to jump to another organization because your kids have aged out of that group yeah. and now you're in the whole new set of of an organization and parents and all that i think that's part of the problem too is you cycle through and then the, the parents with the good eyes and experience are gone and they're like oh well not my problem anymore yeah. on to the next one yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think to tag on to uh, Lee's question too about what these organizations can do. I mean, you you go to somebody like Jamie and say, "Listen, I don't have the but like think about a regular youth hockey organization. They don't have the ability, the budget, the personnel, the time to go into school parking lots and elementary schools and and rec centers and." All the places like I used to laugh all the time when you when you're having tryouts and you and you're you know hey try hockey for free and all the banners are up in the rink I'm like well everybody that's gonna try it for free is already in your rink like you got to go to the seven thousand kids in that downtown Chicago school that have no idea that hockey even exists in their universe so I think that is where the NHL clubs really get so much. Um, you know, you guys are doing it right, but a lot of clubs, you know, that's why the clubs are there. Like go to those clubs, say, listen, I have a school. I want you to do, I want to do a, a you know, a, a program at our school, introduce an alum to our school, bring hockey, you know, into our gym, give us equipment, give us an opportunity. And if I'm a youth hockey rink owner and an organization owner, I'm like, that's gotta be hundreds of thousands of dollars of free advertising and personnel that I can now leverage. And I do nothing more then just open my doors for that next try hockey for free event. So I think, you know, and that's, I think Jamie, that's your point about, well, we, you know, we've never really done that. Don't worry about it. We do it. 
Like we do that for you. And, and we don't want a youth hockey. Or, the Blackhawks don't have a youth hockey organization. So these are all your kids. Like we're actually just getting them going. We're, we're, we're taking the training wheels off and we're letting you take them. Yeah. Like that to me should be the first <laughs> order of business for these organizations. Like, yeah, I want to be seems the so biggest obvious. partner. To the, yeah, it seems so obvious. It's it seems like, so like, obvious. Oh, guess though. what? They're giving all these free kids away and all this free equipment away yeah. and all this free it opportunity away. No, 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 I don't need that. Y'all know it. Hockey culture is real. Oh, yeah. yeah. Big time. We've had to have a number of really tough and honest conversations with people about <laughs> integrity, character, what they're really doing, holding them accountable. So yeah. I I think it's we got a lot of good people here, but we got a lot of bad actors. And so Ooh. part of what we can address is the bad actors to really get this cleaned up because they're they're the ones perpetuating the false narratives. Um, and we do want to do all this work to cre to create the demand to play this game. But we have to know that when we're handing when we're doing this, we're handing a, a six year old off to a club, right. a family off to that club, and they're going to be taken care of in the right way, that there's mm -hmm. going to be integrity and in how that club is going to operate, how they operate with each other, the clubs operate with each other, how they operate with the leagues. Um, so we take that very, very seriously. But in order to do that, you have to have some really hard conversations about behaviors that have to stop. Right. And that's the thing the NHL club can do. That's the hard part, I think, for the clubs to do is for you sure. have an issue with your governing body. If you have clubs that have more money and power, um, that's where it becomes really hard. One of the things we're trying to really actively do is weed out the bad actors because we can come in and say, we're not doing it this way anymore. This is how hockey culture used to run. It's not acceptable anymore. Yeah, and, and that is a culture <clears throat> that has continually evolved and continually changed. I mean, it, it, it's it's one of those things, too. I remember the culture when I was a youth athlete, um, when the game was played significantly different than it is. I mean, I think intimidation was a tactic at that time, and you can imagine what kind of behavior that would breed uh, both on and off the ice, whereas the game has evolved quite a bit now to be a little more talent-based, a little more speed-based. And it's be I think it's better now than it was, but there's still room to grow. Um, you know, you talk about integrity, uh, you know, I think along with integrity, high character is one of those things. And you'll like this segue. Speaking of high character, it is a new era for the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some yeah. someone who has displayed tremendous character throughout his youth career is Connor Bedard, um, who is finishing up right now his first season with the Blackhawks. We have to ask. I mean, it, look, look, there's no way we we're going to do this interview without talking about him. But <laughs> I'm interested um, about your experiences with him, you know, him as a person and how you are working with him to grow the game um, in what is most likely going to be a very long-term relationship. Yeah. So one of the things that we started doing, well, one of the things I realized is um, at least at the Blackhawks, I don't know if other, and this happens at other NHL teams, but we want to make sure that when we put our players in positions to interact with the fan base, that it feels authentic mm -hmm. and core to who they are. And so we sit down with our players even our prospects. And so we did this with Connor. We've done this with all of our prospects, our vets when they come in. And we say, we do a player branding exercise. Like, who are you? How would you describe yourself? We talk to their parents and their families and their coaches. What do you really care about? And one of the things that all of them will say is they care about youth hockey. Mm. Or at least our roster will do anything, whether that's I will surprise and show up for a mic practice. I will go to boys and boys and girls club where we're running floor hockey tournaments. They love that stuff. So let's get them doing that stuff. They're passionate wow. about it. Connor's a great example. Connor, but I will say this is characteristic of the roster we have today. And, and, a, and I would say a testament to Kyle, to Kyle and Luke in requiring that you have as high character as you do competency to be either in our locker room or on our roster is we have these kids that want to give back and these vets that want to give back. And they will, they will do whatever we ask them to do. Connor's very high character, but he, his parents did a great job with him, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but not just Connor, Kevin, Alex, like I could list everybody all the way up to Nick Felino. Like this whole roster is willing to show it for the community because they get it. They know how special it is to hear the anthem while they're standing on the blue line, right? Like the fans own the franchise. This roster gets it. Connor mm. gets it. He understands he's the face of the NHL now, too. It's amazing. I forget how you, you forget he how young. you interact yes. with him, and you're like, oh, yeah. my gosh, yeah, he's 
18. He's not even 19. Yet. He is young. He's a very young man. <laughs> he is, people okay. forget that. Great. It's no, great. It's you know, incredible, no. though. I mean, he's very grounded. Yeah. It's so, just amazing. Yeah. yeah. So if we ask him to do something, he he's willing. Not only is he willing to do it, he's excited to do it, and he shows up and he engages and he leans in. But that's true of everybody on our roster right now. Um, right. So the locker room culture that we're building um, is very much. Uh, also very fan focused and fan first, right? It's an attitude of gratitude. We're nothing without these fans. Right. They, they yeah, give us you don't need to chime in. We don't want to cause any problem with the Cubs, but I mean, hockey <laughs> players are number one outreach individuals and characters. They just They're are. I mean, I've, I've been around tons yeah. of pro basketball players, baseball yeah. players, football players. There's no doubt that hockey players and I think I think even other sports would say, yeah, those guys are crazy. They'll do anything. Like they show up for, you know, they show up for like a youth hockey weekend, and and, and then like a a kid like Connor Bedard, he'll actually get out there and start playing ball yeah. hockey with the kids, like and, yeah. and, and do it all this stuff. We learned with our players, kids, yeah. puppies, and old people. They <laughs> right. Anything they easy. Free. like consistently across the board. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Our but I think I think we, around I, how we get into the community, we. Focus yeah. on some of those things. Kids, and puppies, and old people. It's a recipe know. right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jamie, I'll say this too on this front. And, and, and again, <clears throat> I'm only bringing this up for a reason because this isn't supposed to be like a hockey ops con uh, conversation. But, you know, from a from a hockey standing standpoint, the Blackhawks are not where they want to be right now. But what you just said shows you two things. One, that when you're when you're rebuilding or in the process of growing, this is an integral part of it is to make sure you're connected with your community. And two, and I think this is speaks loudly for, for hockey players in general, especially professional hockey players, where they are in the standings is irrelevant to the type of people they are and the character they're going to share, right? And that, you know, when you want to build an organization, I'm not talking about the NHL, when you want to build an organization, youth hockey, college, junior, anything, this is a huge part of it. Your ability to communicate, have high character, build trust with your people, whether it's parents and youth athletes or fan base, right? Or both in some cases. Um, so I, I, I'm only noting that, again, I'm not trying to make fun of the Blackhawks. I'm saying that even in a position that I think some people could look at and say, well, you know, they don't even, you know, who cares, right? <laughs> like, like that it's, it's the opposite of that, the, the, the dedication, if anything, even more to that. Right, um, right now. So I, I just think that that's well, an children, amazing character children, study. Old people and puppies don't know what the record is. Yeah. Can you we know, add so veterans into that? They, they, oh, <laughs> they, just, they, just want, they just want they just want to be around yeah. these great people. Yeah. In our market, first responders. Yeah. Military. Yeah. I mean, they they are the fabric of this fan base. Right. Yeah. The workers in this city. Um, our players get that. What I would say is they understand their jobs too. Um, whether that's their specific job on ice, but they understand their job in being a Blackhawk. And we actually start to teach them that in development camp. So right. we were one of the first clubs to do a non-ice development camp last year to Love teach it. them how to be a Blackhawk. Here's what's expected of that's you. That's awesome. Um, Jamie, I, I had a question for you. So, and maybe you could, cause I, I mean, just speaking to you now and, and understanding, you know, Lee's bio and everything, and, and just, you, you, pro you really come from a, from a unique perspective here because you're not only a parent of children, you're a billet parent, mm -hmm. and you've seen prospect type kids come through. I mean, is that how does that color the way you look at fan development and outreach and the, and the kind of programs that you want to do? It's a great uh, question, just Mike. because of how close you are with the kids that are actually impacted the most by this. I mean, I, I would say having five kids, I understand every. Gen I'm a great focus group for every generation because. We're walking past, but we've seen it now. I mean, it was super helpful for me coming in because I had seen, you know, Jacob Slavin was our first billet kid. I had seen right. his journey all the way to the NHL. He's still there. Also comes from an incredible family, is as high character as he is high competent um, as one of the best defensemen um, and the importance of that. Um, and so, you know, I'm bringing all those experiences into how we build this out. So is our leadership team here. Uh, but I would say the same thing on the hockey side. We've got incredible hockey leadership as well. We work very closely together because we have to, um, and we should. And so aligning aligning our objectives of what it means to be a Blackhawk, but how that shows up either programmatically for our players and how Kyle thinks about what that looks like in the development process of players and how we think about it in the development process. You know, we're dealing with the kids that are for – to 18, he's dealing with them when they're 18 on. And so 
being consistent about what we believe to be true about that process, what's important about players, again, coaches, we've lined it up so we're consistent, right? And what he's saying and what he's delivering is no different than what we're saying and what we're delivering and what we believe to be true about how you need to show up every day, whether you're the ref, you're the coach, you're the player, you're the family, um, that your skill isn't as, as important as your character, whether you're six or you're 16. Um, those things we hold true across how both of us are building out sort of this organization and how the Blackhawks are showing up. Right. So, also, Jamie, you know, it is Women's History Month, and I'm just so impressed that the Blackhawks have, you know, brought in a working mom. You're busy. you got a lot on your plate, but your perspective is helping to shape the future of, of not only professional hockey, but youth hockey, too. Uh, are the organizations getting better in bringing women into the fold? Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of women here, but, and I would say, you know, I, when I went to the league, when I came here, my perception was the league wasn't very diverse. The Blackhawks weren't very diverse. Hockey wasn't diverse. I actually think that's a false narrative. Wow. Um, I am very impressed with the diversity at the league level. We certainly are very diverse here, but diverse in thinking, whether it's gender, working parents, former military, like the dimensions of diversity are very broad. Um, we are very diverse. And I think we're working really hard to give people opportunities to come into hockey and stay in hockey and elevate in hockey. Um, I know what my obligation is as a female leader, right? And bringing up women who may want to work in hockey at higher roles or any, any sports role. Um, but uh, it's something that we care about deeply, not, not only just how we show up here, how the league shows up, but Again, we're we're if we believe that to be true, we're going to bring that into amateur hockey. We want just as many boys playing as we want girls playing hockey. I'm so glad you shared that because I was also under the impression right. you want that to just say, girls, just say girls as boys or boys as girls. We want as many girls as boys because they <laughs> have more boys right. than girls. We have work to do, and we have work to do in Illinois to get more girls to play hockey. Okay, that will work on. But yeah, this is inspiring to know that um, that it's more diverse than. What the narrative is out there. Fantastic. Yeah, it really is. It, it really is. And if it's not, quite honestly, I will say, like, as a parent of little kids, it's hard to be in these roles when your job is nights, weekends, holidays, and have little ones, right? Like, that's for a working mom or dad who might be the primary parent, that's a hard decision to make because you really sure. are trading off that time with your kids. Um, if I didn't have such a great husband who gets it, and we have opposite seasons, thank goodness, um, <laughs> that allows us to figure out how to how it works. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it is far more diverse than I think we get credit for. That's great. Is your job fun? I love it. <laughs> I, the number of times I sit in meetings and I'm like, I'm so lucky to be here <laughs> doing this. Like, I think I walk into this job every day grateful for the people I work with, for the opportunity we have. But I I think we all take it very seriously. The obligation we our words carry weight here. Mm -hmm. Our actions carry weight. So we we can either show up every day and do good for the sport or we can do good for ourselves. And I think one of the things we're trying to do is say the Blackhawks and hockey is way bigger than any individual ego, even here in our office or in the locker room. And if we do right by the org, if we do right by the sport, everybody's going to win. And so that's sort of the approach we take. We feel the same way. I know <clears throat> from speaking to my team here, just doing this podcast, it's like, how awesome is this that we get to do this? Right. Um, but you are segueing into something I want to ask you, Jamie, is that, you know, look, Chicago is an original six franchise. It is one of the most iconic brands in professional sports, mm -hmm. right? Like this goes beyond just hockey when you talk about the Chicago Blackhawks. So I'm, I'm actually going to ask this question a little bit more as a hockey fan or like a hockey business yeah. fan. Um, cause you alluded to it. How do you, and you specifically take on that responsibility as a sports executive? Um, and, and does it influence your decision-making? Because, you know, look, not that every NHL club doesn't take this seriously, but look, if you're an executive with the Seattle Kraken or the Vegas Golden Knights, totally different environment right now. Um, you know, the Black Blackhawks are just short of a hundred years. If I'm not correct and, and mistaken, right? Like you're just about to hit your centennial. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine there's a, a weight with that in a good way, but how do you take that on day to day? I think what I've learned 
is like, I'm a futurist. I'm a strategist and a futurist. So taking a hundred year old franchise and figuring out how to evolve it into the future is pretty easy for me. And I think our leadership team, I think the thing that we have to constantly hold true and keep ourselves grounded is we have an amazing fan base globally, actually. Yeah. And you can't forget where you came from. And I think that's the important thing, right? What, what honoring the people that have come before us, we are where we are today because of the rosters we had in the past, mm -hmm. the coaches we've had, the GMs, the success, the, you know, the different generations of the words family that have run this franchise. Right. So I think learning how to balance honoring the past and where to push for the future is great. If you're the Kraken or Vegas, you, you don't have to worry about what happened. There's nothing. You have no, no history. Past, yeah. That's the downside for you because it's harder when you go into a Winter Classic or something. But you have this free, open thing. You can do whatever you want. For us, we have to be really responsible to honor our history and what got us here and not completely deviate and be a franchise that's unrecognizable. So right. how do we take the best of what we have, add the best of what's possible? And, and that's striking that balance can be really hard we are about to celebrate our centennial yeah. not this year but the year after and as we're, we're we've been planning that for a while what are we going to honor and remember how do we how do we celebrate that but then also turn the chapter for what the future is it's really about understanding the responsibility and balancing all of that i think yeah and look it's not easy to reinvent yourself over and over and over and over again and, and i meant i made this note earlier in the show that you know when you have a hundred year history you have fans spanning generations of of yeah. of you know families mm -hmm. um and you have to cater to them as well right while also maintaining this future so um i, I guess i'm just trying to impress upon our audience that the, the, the it's a massive responsibility and and again like this is hockey like you said you're shaping hockey mm -hmm. <laughs> in a larger way um, I'll also note that the Blackhawks consistently are the number one jersey as voted all the time across all sports. Um, I don't disagree with that. I think um, Jersey is the number one jersey and has been which the one is? selling jersey this season for the NHL. Oh, I believe. Look, look, I'm in Philadelphia. We're seeing them everywhere. Uh, yeah. And again, look, it's tough not to love that kid. I, 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 yeah. Just really quick to, to kind of fanboy a little bit. When he won the uh, World Junior Championship and they asked him about him and his answer was about, I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about the team. Now, as a coach. And as a team builder, I'm like, I love that kid. <laughs> I love yeah. that kid for saying that. I so, mean, even last night, we 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 had an opportunity. We had an open net. The, the net was empty. He gets the puck. He could have very easily – there's probably, I think, 30-something seconds left in the game. He could have very easily popped that into the net. He held on to it. Right. It's just sort of like – he's just not about himself. Yeah. But – all our players had that opportunity last night and they really are. I think they really are embodying what team means and putting something bigger than themselves, making that more important, right. um, <clears throat> which is great. And that's really what we want to do as we grow our fan base is, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, this franchise is owned by the fan base. So our job, I wake up every day, our leaders wake up. Every, we work for the fans. Right. Pure and simple. Love it. So we got to, that means we have to know what they care about. We have to know what they want. And then we can build the programs in there that helps fans that are here today, all those day ones that you're talking about that have been with us generationally and all those new littles that are walking into rinks that we hope one day are bringing their kids to the Blackhawks. So I love it. That's, that's the job. So <clears throat> one last question for me, um, because we're kind of at the top of the hour here. Um, I want to talk about you being a billet family. Um, and not just any billet family. You mentioned before Jacob Slavin has come through your home, uh, a very prominent all-star in the NHL now. Um, so I think it's safe to say you understand talent, you know talent, um, but I'm curious as a billet mom, like what's your favorite story? What have you seen? Like talk to the people a little bit about the people who've come through your house. Um, sell, that, building, uh, sell building, sell building, sell, sell the building. We need more, we need more billet. <laughs> we need more billet families. Yeah, it's so funny because we were people thought we were crazy to billet, and with the reason we first volunteered is because our neighbors had these incredible kids who were like, "That's the type of teenager we want around our kids," um, right. and we loved billeting. I mean, we'd probably still do it if we lived close enough. Well, I probably couldn't in the, my current role, but we would have done it if we lived close enough to a rink. Um, I think these athletes at this level have, they've got to be very good time managers. 
they do even at the juniors level have to give back. Mm -hmm. Um, they're just modeling so many good things. And at the time that we had Jacob, I had an eight, six and four year old, the, the bigs were littles at that time. (laughs) And so the stuff that they learned from having him around the house, cleaning up after himself, right. I mean, just even the little things were such a great example for our kids. Their family is so close to our family or they were actually my family. I couldn't go, um, because my kid broke his leg playing hockey. Um, oh, they just were out. I'm sorry. So when the Black Hawks went out, oh, half the family okay. went out to stay with Jacob. Um, but I think anytime you get really good teenagers around your kids that model sort of how to behave and they, they do have to work really hard to be able to find all the time in. And we were very fortunate. We had incredible boys that really were great role models for our kids in a lot of different ways. Jacob certainly, um, started us off right. He, he was great. A tremendous he, person. Building, building yeah. is not what I think I thought building was or like the stories of what building was a long time ago. And I think that's because juniors is a serious business. Those kids are trying to get college scholarships. Yeah. They're trying to get opportunities. They take it very seriously. It's not, it's not a joke to them and they need really good families that can come support them. And also like you're sending your kids away when they're 16. You want to know they're in a house that's safe. So as a mom, I know what it's like when you're sending your kid away at 16 because um, I'm on the other side of it. Right. Um, so, yeah, I would advocate be a billet. It's a great experience. That's amazing stuff. What well, I, I will say for all three of us, we hope that your son's leg is OK. He's fine. You know yeah. what? The goalie skated out as a skater, which never happened. Took him out and yeah. he broke his leg playing hockey. That's yeah. how the sport yeah. goes, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Build adversity. <laughs> Uh, Mike Christie is well, right. He, he can, he can sit there and talk to Connor Bertard firsthand and find out what to do with a broken hand. <laughs> That's hand. a good. So he's got a good. He's got a good role model right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have given us so much great advice, uh, especially when it comes to youth hockey organizations needing t- to rethink and to think about their organizations. Are they really? Do they have the kids' best interests at heart? That's what it's all about. That's what it's important. Um, so hopefully this episode will inspire the youth hockey organizations out there to to get started and to to do what's right. It may it may it's not gonna happen overnight, as you said, mm-hmm. but if y'all come together and come to terms and just think about the kids, what's best for the kids, that's mm-hmm. what should come first. So thank you very much for giving us a lot to think about, Jamie. Well, thanks. Yeah, and I think I think the same way too is that if you're a parent listening to this, you can be that leader. You know, you could be the one saying, "I know organization A, you have a lot on your plate. I know you're doing else. I can help you. I have a four year old. I would love to see the Blackhawks in my rink. I would love to see them more involved in keeping my four year old here in this rink until they're eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, or whatever it is. So, you know, if you're that parent, that's this is a great opportunity to stop. You know complaining and and make a change and you have an, if you have organizations like this nhl organizations that you can lean on christy brings it up all the time if you have ahl organizations that you can lean on and minor league programs that want to get into the community step up and and it, you're you'll be amazed at how many resources are out there for you mm. well jamie i talk a lot um but i don't i don't think i can sum this up any better than my co-host just did so i'll just say thank you for being here today <laughs> Wow, this is the first. It is. <laughs> that is okay. No, Jamie, thanks for being on. We really appreciate the time today. Thanks yes, for having me. You're I pretty amazing. Let me tell you, what an inspiration you are. Thank I, you. I, I agree it was fun. But th- that is going to do it for this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey, powered by NHL Censoring. And remember, you can listen to all of our episodes at OurKidsPlayHockey.com. Before Jamie Faulkner, Mike Benelli, and Christy Cash on Burns, I'm Lee Elias. We will see you on the next edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Take care, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.